Welcome to Worldview Matters, discussing controversial issues, discerning current events, defending biblical Christianity. No topic off limits. And now, here's your host, David Fiorazzo. Hey, friends, and welcome to episode 200. Unbelievable. We made it this far. Uh, it's because of God's sovereignty and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, and you for powering this podcast, Worldview Matters. So thank you. We've got a list of people who have donated financially. Uh, many of you are monthly donors, meaning I guess every month it, it's uh automatic it's just just amazing guys 200 episodes and um glory be to god and I, and that's one of my prayers almost every time i say lord help us glorify you today help us to encourage and equip the saints the body of christ and help us be uh, understand the times and sense the urgency of the hours so i just wanted to open that up and say thank you for allowing us to hit episode 200 on worldviewmatters.tv. So before we get to our guest, Pastor Dean Dwyer from Australia, I want to encourage you guys to subscribe to our Rumble channel, Freedom Project on Rumble. I've got a Rumble channel as well. Find me there. Also, Freedom Project Media has an app for your iPhone that you can download for free. So check out the Freedom Project Media app. So thank you for growing us on Rumble. We're going to need that. As you know, last month I was kicked off YouTube for being a naughty boy, violating community standards. You know that biblical worldview and speaking the truth can get you into trouble. Speaking of trouble, let's bring in one of those troublemakers for the kingdom of God, Pastor Dean Dwyer, and he's the pastor of Iser Street Baptist Church, Toowoomba, Australia. Brother, so good to see you. G'day from Australia, David. We are the glorious land down under. And as we learned from the Olympics, the land of strange breakdancing. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, my goodness. You, I'm so glad we're I not going to talk about the clip. Yeah. yeah, I did. <laughs> if, oh. if you've seen the clip, look, the irony is that pretty much that's how Australians dance. But <laughs> I think there was a lot more break and not enough dancing. Oh boy, what the Olympic, what a joke. Shame on the International Olympic Committee and the demonic opening the ceremonies. It's just bizarre stuff, but it's you know, they're not, you know, believers and I understand they're trying to please the world and whatever. Mm -hmm. Um before we dive into the same the topic today by the way, friends, embracing the irrational and normalizing rebellion. That's what we're talking about. You can check out some of the articles we'll be referring to. Uh, Pastor Dean Dwyer on harbingersdaily.com. He's got a page there. You can check out some of these articles. Uh, scroll down a little bit to catch them on Harbingers Daily. Um, Dean, congrats on being full-time senior pastor at your church since July 1st. Um, I don't think we've talked to you since then. Uh, no, the last time we talked was back in May, so that's oh. all happened as a result, yeah, wow. in the interim. But uh, well, look, we praise God for that. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that very much. As you know, and as many of you viewers know, for those who don't, the impetus for that really was a pretty bad motorcycle accident, and that gave me the time that I needed to reflect, mm -hmm. and God really spoke through that. And as I say to people, the... The great paradox of faith sometimes, and this was reflected in my life as well, that in order for me to take a step of faith, God had to break my back. So mm -hmm. even though they were difficult times, then God has brought, has brought something just wonderful out of it, and we count it just a great blessing and a privilege to be able to serve him full-time here at Isa Street Baptist. Yeah, I told... Um... Uh, before we got on the podcast, I told you, man, you, your your flock, your church is in good hands, and they are blessed to have you. Uh, I you. love you, brother, and uh, appreciate your voice and your thank teachings you. and your writings. And I'm um, just thankful that we can connect across continents here. Um, so, uh, you know, I want to jump into this. It, it, we're, we're trying to equip and encourage the body of Christ, but also mm -hmm. make some points and help us to understand that from the biblical perspective, there is spiritual warfare going on all the time. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I always say, though Ephesians 6 clearly states our, tr our struggle is not against flesh mm -hmm. and blood. We know the enemy, Satan, uses flesh and blood. He uses people. He uses institutions. He uses governments. He uses evil men um, to 
do their his bidding. So what we're talking about today, characteristics of Satan's kingdom, you called it spiritual anarchy, Dean. And that's the overall theme for today. And um, we will get to, I think a lot of people can understand em- embracing the irrational because that's mm. where a lot of our societies are at today. So walk us through this wherever you want to start. And I think you're going to get to unity. But if you want to set this up first and why you decided to touch on these things now, go ahead. Mm, absolutely. Well, I think as you touched on before, really the impetus for this came from the Olympics. Now, if I was an athlete in the Olympics, I'd be pretty annoyed that I put in all this hard work for four years. I've trained and worked really hard, got to the pinnacle of my sporting career. Mm. And then that was overshadowed really by what I call Satan's revival meeting, which is the <laughs> opening and the closing ceremony, because that's really what it is. It draws the nations together. It draws the people together. The eyeballs of the world are upon this stage and what he puts forward is just this spirit of darkness. And Mm. as we often say to people, you've got to be able to discern through your worldview. Now, we know, and as your show is entitled, worldview matters. That matters in everybody's life. And if you've got a worldview that's based on a spirit of darkness, well, you're going to embrace some of those things that were portrayed at the Olympic Games. And I guess this is why people can't understand the Christian worldview and why Christians were so upset Because if you're looking at the opening and closing ceremonies through the paradigm of darkness, then you might not necessarily see anything that was wrong with what happened there. Mm -hmm. But when you're looking through it through the paradigm of light, when you're looking through it in a biblical worldview, through the lens of the Bible, then in your spirit, you can easily discern that what happened on that stage and in and around those Olympics was Mm -hmm. incredibly dark. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, to the discerning, I, to those who adhere to the biblical worldview, understand scripture, um, it's clear. I mean, I, I, I was so saddened for some of those athletes, as you said, worked so hard. Yeah. And then they put out this, you know, demonic introduction in the opening ceremony. And, it, and a lot of people boycotted, rightly so. A lot of people, a lot of good, yeah. you know, people. Uh, it's just really sad, but that's the way it is, the way of the world. Um mm which may transition into one of your articles that we wanted to touch on today, Worshipping Madness, Mm. Um, because it is the darkness, but darkness is irrational. It is madness. And uh, you talk about how the new world order demands a new God. But Mm. before we dive into that more, Dean, um, I want you to talk about unity some more, Mm. because I find that fascinating that in the Olympics, countries want to unite, right? And, you know, put out this front of global peace and prosper, whatever else. But in the United States, unity, you would think it wouldn't be a bad thing, but there are, are people with the don't have a biblical worldview that we should not be uniting with. And that means in the church too, maybe good causes, but I mean, I mean, an atheist can do good works, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Go that's ahead, exactly sir. right. And we're talking off air about the book of Jude. And for any Christian who hasn't read it, I'd encourage you to do so. It's I mean, very, very short book, but it gives us the context behind why Jude was so forceful in contending for the faith, because our faith is something very precious to us. And of course, he was speaking about the concept of false teachers and apostates and those that the enemy sends into the church. And I think this is one of his tactics, because in any type of warfare, what you want to try to do is blunt the effectiveness of the opposing offensive army. And I think this is what he's been very good at, is that in terms of blunting the effectiveness of the church, he wants to keep the church busy. Now, he keeps the church busy in terms of some of the social justice causes, and he keeps the church busy by having to contend all of the time with false teachers and apostates that he sends in. Because if we're busy doing that, and if our energy is being drained with having to deal with all of the internal drama all of the time, well, guess what? The church doesn't have... The the energy doesn't have the time and the focus to be able to deal with some of those outward issues that are really important in the world today. So this is what you were saying in terms of there's some things that just don't coalesce in the Christian life. We can't have light and darkness coalescing. Therefore, we can't have faith and apostasy coalescing as well. So this is going to become an increasing problem in the church today where you've got apostates and false teachers really making inroads in there. And of course, Jude gives us some very solid advice. That is to contend for the faith. 
Mm. This is going to have to be a very deliberate action. This is going to have to be a continuing action, which is going to take intense prayer. It's going to take intense work and being able, once again, it comes back to discernment, being able to discern exactly what's going on and using the discernment of the Holy Spirit in order to contend. And, you know, in some instances, we have to remove these people from the midst because otherwise they can be incredibly destructive to the work of the church. Let's contend for the faith that was once for all handed down from the apostles or to the saints. I just paraphrased that in Jude. Um, I'm thinking of there's world events and meetings that different religions go to. Maybe the I don't know. There's so many different kinds, but I, I can I can see pictures of a Muslim imam with the pope with an apostate LGBTQ, you know, gay affirming church, which you've got to put church in air quotes. And then they've got someone, a, a Hindu, you know, so they've got all these different religions and they're uniting. But for what cause? Usually, oftentimes, Dean, and I wasn't planning on getting into this. Oftentimes it's for the environment. Well, you're putting the environment over people, population control. That's a, a big issue. But these religious leaders are uniting for this cause and Christians, we've got to look at that and discern and say, that's, uh, yeah, we need to take care of the planet while we're here, but we don't unite with everyone that believes anything, uh, cults and other, you know, world religions to put the planet as a top priority. And, and then, you know, where that goes, the re result of that abortion, population control, euthanasia and go on. Just briefly comment on that before we continue. Absolutely. This is the paradox in Satan's kingdom is that unity requires rebellion. So his determination of unity means that we have to turn against God and join his kingdom of darkness. And we know that unbelievers have done that by default. And so what I often say to people is that in rebellion, people don't often gather around monuments anymore. So we're talking about false idols and the like. But people gather around moments, and Satan uses moments. He uses things like, as you said, abortion rights. He uses things like uh, the environmental cause. He uses things uh, like kicking prayer out of parliamentary meetings and so forth. This whips up rebellion so that people unite. People unite when they've got when they get behind a cause, people unite when they're fearful. And so we can see the manifestation of these things. We saw that through the last four years, and we can see that, as you said, around the concept of climate change as well, because if he can get people to unite around this moment, this issue that's supposedly affecting the whole planet, then he can start to coalesce people that wouldn't ordinarily uh, come together so that mm. convictions are dropped, beliefs are dropped, so that we can all come together and head in the one direction. So that's that's the paradox with Satan's kingdom, is that there's a certain element of rebellion which really ferments that unity. But, Dean, we, we've got to unite so we can face this existential threat of climate change. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm joking. Um, but that's what they, the language they use. It's like the most the most important thing we've got to come against as, as human beings. No, don't buy, buy the hype, friends. But you talk about the examples you mentioned Unity to protect abortion rights, unity to protect the LGBTQ agenda. What about Israel? We've seen unity on college campuses, but it's not the kind mm. of unity that Bible-believing Christians should be a part of or support. A comment, and then we'll take a break. Oh, absolutely right. I mean, and again, it comes back to how you discern your worldview. I mean, we are led to believe that there's this paradigm in the world that there's the oppressor and the victim. And for those who like to position themselves as victim, then it seems that automatically they get the sympathy and they get the weight of social consensus and political consensus behind them. So this is exactly what's been happening. And we know this, this happens through Marxism as well, that if you can introduce some of these ideas and conceptualise them and they manifest in the physical world and then all of a sudden you can harness social power behind that. And that's unfortunately exactly what's happened with the anti-Israel pro protests because it is based on a lie. It is based on the paradigm of darkness and untruth. And so people have fallen victim to it. 
So friends, we're speaking to Pastor Dean Dwyer, and you can get uh, more of his writings and some of his teachings at harbingersdaily.com. And on the left-hand column, there's a bunch of uh, authors and and, uh, contributors there, and Dean is one of them. And I want to talk about when we come back, he sent me some bullet points on these characteristics of Satan's kingdom, including globalism, commission, rulers, false teachers, redefined language, worship, and we'll see what we can get to with Pastor Dean Dwyer on Worldview Matters next. Today's show is brought to you by Harbinger's Daily, world news biblically understood. Stay informed at harbingersdaily.com. If you're interested in sponsoring Worldview Matters or you know someone who might be, send us an email, worldviewmatters at fpeusa.org, the website, worldviewmatters.tv. So, Dean Dwyer, it's going by way too fast today. Um, We can talk about globalism or we can talk about commission, uh, whatever you'd like to jump to next. And friends, the the, um, article, there's a couple of his articles at Harbinger's Daily. If you miss any of this, we can't get to all the points, but go ahead, Dean. Yeah, thank you, David. We always run out of time. I said you're far too much material, but let's just go through them quickly because I think there's some important points there. We've got a commission in our Christian life. We know that we've got to go into all nations, make disciples, share the gospel. Well, Satan has a commission in his kingdom as well, and it comes back to that old phrase, do what thou wilt. And so for Satan, we see a lot of his acolytes uh, out there spreading his message. Now, it comes back to the basis of our interview today, which is embracing the irrational And I think what we can start to see in the world today, particularly through movies, through music, through television shows, is that really his acolytes are busy spreading his message throughout his kingdom because some of the things that we're seeing, particularly in music videos and performances like the Grammys and so forth, there's some very, very dark things there. And unfortunately, this is corrupting young minds as well. So that's his commission and unfortunately he's got no shortage of people who are ready to fulfill that role within his kingdom it's interesting that leads on to the next point when we talk about rulers and i've talked about this recently in our congregation because when we get to psalm 2 which is the enthronement psalm we see though their conspiracy and for anyone who says there's no conspiracy in the world well there's conspiracy in the bible because as jb hickson often says Conspiracy is just two or more people conspiring together to devise a wicked scheme. So we absolutely see the people, the kings and the rulers gathering together, taking counsel together. And I pointed out to some of our people recently that when we talk about rulers and we go back to the original language, it talks about rulers in a judicial sense through a court system. And we certainly see Satan working through that in terms of liberal judges, but rulers really refers to those whose word carries weight. Mm. So in a judicial sense, absolutely. But in another sense, whose word carries the most weight in our world today? Celebrities. It's, celebrities. it's music stars. I got it's, that from your article. That's exactly right. So this is what we're not understanding as a society as well, is that, mm. see, Satan, he can work through kings, but for most democratic countries, there's an election every three or four years. So his agenda can only be pushed through, let's say, at the best, every three or four years. But if he sets up rulers, celebrities, those whose word carries weight throughout the world, then he can spread his message. And what we're seeing is that some of these kids from a very early age appeared to be very innocent when they first came on the scene. But now all of a sudden they go into adulthood and something changes. It goes from innocence to something very dark. And for those that have taken on this journey with them, those who follow these celebrities for a long period of time, all of a sudden they're being led into this corruptibility and this darkness, in some cases this witchcraft as well. So this is where we see Satan really active in the world today. So it's an encouragement to parents and for anyone really of any age just to be really careful what you are allowing into your mind because he is really starting to push that message through those screens at the moment. Yes, and I think, Dean, this would be a nice transition. Uh, Another characteristic of Satan's kingdom is the redefinition of words and language. And let's talk about that briefly. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the prime example of that is Isaiah 520. I mean, 
for those who have a biblical worldview, how can you call good evil and evil good? How can you put light for darkness, darkness for light, mm -hmm. bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter? But this is exactly what happens. I mean, in Satan's kingdom, we know that for Satan, what God ordains, Satan opposes. So in order to build a framework of his kingdom, which is built once again on spiritual rebellion, to get people to embrace the irrational, what he has to do is redefine the language. So all of a sudden, if evil becomes good, well, guess what? That's the foundation of your kingdom. That's the foundation of your worldview. And for those who embrace these types of ideas, then not only are they embraced, but unfortunately they're defended and they're celebrated. And this is really the manifestation of what we're seeing today. People have accepted the inversion or the redefinition of these concepts and they believe them, they accept them, they defend them and they celebrate them. And we can see that happening very, very clearly throughout the world today because this is all being very much normalised. And again, it comes back to, well, this is how Satan wants his kingdom to operate. If he wants to build a certain type of language for his subjects, so to speak, to speak in his language, uh, in his kingdom, well, then this is the language that he promotes throughout the world. Normalizing rebellion, spiritual anarchy, but be, let's, before we run out of time, we've got to talk about embracing the irrational, and that is uh, Dionysus. Is that I say that right? Mm. Go ahead and walk, Look, talk. Go ahead. Varying ways. Dionysus is typically the accepted way of saying it. But I think, and I used in the article the example of the dress from 2015. And if people remember it, there's this dress that sent the internet into meltdown because some people saw the dress as black and blue. Other people saw the dress as white and gold. And so this was a viral phenomena at the time because there's 11,000 tweets per minute about this particular topic. <laughs> and see, there was a lot of studies done on this. And so what it came down to is that if your brain is wired in a particular way to see the dress in certain colours, well, you could see it as black and blue or you could see it as white and gold. And the, the amazing thing was that if you saw it in a particular set of colours, you couldn't see it in the other set. And I think I mentioned this because when we looked at the Olympic opening ceremony, we had people who looked at the opening ceremony and said, well, you know what, that's great. You know, this is a great celebration of our world today. Those of us who have a biblical worldview looked at the Olympics and said, well, you know what, this is dark, this is evil. And I mentioned this in the article because this is exactly what's happened. If your brain is wired in a particular way to see darkness as light, well, you're going to enjoy what the Olympics had to offer. But if you have a biblical worldview where you can see darkness for what it is, then what we saw at the Olympics was a parody of the Last Supper. But we also saw overlaid in front of that this weird blue character by the name of Dionysus. And so in that article, we walk through exactly who Dionysus was. He was the god of wine and revelry, but... He was a god that people liked to worship because they descended into ritual madness. Not madness as we would consider it in terms of psychiatric illness, but just this absolute release of inhibition so that they could do what they wanted to do. Mm. And we see this concept right throughout history that the dark side of human nature is that they want to revel in the debauchery and the wickedness and the corruptibility. And so... What we saw at the Olympics, to me, was very plain, that you've got a parody of the Last Supper, but then in front of that, the New World Order has put their God in front of that, and that's Dionysus. This is the one they want to worship in debauchery. Mm -hmm. And if you're familiar with some of the festivals that Dionysus led, as the night went on, they said, and as the wine flowed, they said, old and young were together. Now, that is something we unfortunately are seeing in the world today. We're seeing yeah. a gradual normal normalization of sexual immorality in relation to adults and children. Mm. And I've read some material around some of these feasts of Dionysus, and there's rumors that these still happen today. And 
It's certainly not appropriate for me to recount those on this show because you can only imagine just the wickedness and the evil and the sexual immorality that goes on. But this is, unfortunately, what they've put out to the world. This is what they've celebrated at the Olympics opening ceremony. So Mm -hmm. when you look at it through this framework, then you can't help but say this was absolutely evil. And the message we received from Paris, as you mentioned loud and clear, Christianity is not welcome in the New World Order. But I want to mention Mm. one of the rituals involved trans-inducing substances. You read about Mm. that. Pharmakia. Um, Mm. You mentioned that, Dean, a couple podcasts ago when we had you on as a guest, talking about what happened in Israel October 7th with some of the radicals from Hamas using these psychedelic these mm. drugs pharmacia so they would wouldn't have any inhibitions and they couldn't even sense the evil that they were doing uh guys if you d- don't remember that podcast at worldviewmatters.tv just put in the search bar dean dwyer and that was probably earlier this year or the end of last year or earlier this year when we talked about that but just mm. i mean that plays in here pharmacia it helps you you know get into this trance and just just do whatever you want do what thou wilt right Oh, absolutely, yeah. So the drugs that Hamas operatives use was a drug called Captagon. And so that is a real problem in the Middle East because that funds a lot of this terrorism as well. It's a very popular mm. drug used by Middle Eastern men. And that really, I mean, they don't sleep for days. Uh, all of their conscience is destroyed and they can do things that ordinary people wouldn't do. And so this plays into what we see in the tribulation period because we know that there's pharmakia mentioned in mm. there. And For the feasts of Dionysus, absolutely. They used wine, they used these trance-inducing substances because they wanted to descend into this ritual madness or ritual ecstasy. Hmm. And so what we see at the Olympics was that, as I said in the article, the new world order demands a new God. And for those Hmm. unfamiliar with Dionysus, he was, in the myth, a God-man because he had a mortal mother, Samil, and an immortal father in Zeus. So how ironic that the New World Order is looking to a God-man to lead them into sin, all the while rejecting the God-man who died for their sin. Interesting. Mankind needs to worship something, right? Absolutely. And Mm -hmm. that's That's a a point you make indirectly in your articles. Uh, Pastor Dean, we run out of time. It's just always a blessing to have you on. By the way, friends, Iser Street Baptist Church, Dot com And also you can go to Harbinger's Daily. Brother, I appreciate you and your writing, and it's so good to have you on uh, as, as frequently as we can here. Uh, continue to lead that flock, brother. I know you're uh, doing a great job, but pray for Pastor Dean's protection and provision for him. Uh, friends, right now we are thinking of it, and uh, thanks for your time today. Thank you. God bless you and the team and everyone there. Thanks to Harbinger's Daily for their support. Wonderful, wonderful ministry. Yes, and may the Lord enlarge your territory, brother, in Jesus' name. Uh, Friends, thank you so much. God bless you. And as always, keep speaking the truth about things that matter.